Hey there. See a lot of videos out there on uh, how to use resistors and how to calculate Ohm's law and various applications for uh, resistors and things like that. I haven't really seen anything that uh, goes over the different types of resistors that exist. For the most part, uh, most hobby electronics will be using uh, fairly simple carbon film type resistors. Nothing really complicated or all that, but you know, every once in a while you need a, a different kind of resistor for something. I have a fairly large collection of unusual, perhaps, uh, types of resistors, so I thought I would uh, just give a quick overview of various types of resistors in use. Here you've got a carbon resistor. This is uh, something that most of you should be familiar with. This is what you would find in most through-hole electronics. It's a quarter watt. This is a one watt. I think this is a three watt. This is related. It's similar. I believe this is metal film. But uh, what makes this particularly special is it's a uh, flame proof. Carbon resistors have a tendency to catch on fire at times or throw sparks. The uh, flame proof ones have a fire retardant. Uh, another common thing you'll see here is uh, it's a resistor pack. It's multiple resistors tied to a common. So one pin is one side of all the resistors and each individual pin is a resistor connection itself. It's used on uh, various logic ICs. You pull them up or pull them down. They're not used as much anymore because the microcontrollers and various chips, FPGAs, have pull up and pull down resistors already inside the chip. So it's just a matter of software on those to instruct it to engage one of the pull up or pull down resistors. Now these here are all wire wound. A high precision wire wound has an accuracy of 0.5%. This would be used in uh, audio and RF attenuators and things like that. Anywhere you need a very accurate control of the signal level entering a circuit. So right here is just a common ceramic wire wound. Nothing special about it. Same type of resistor. This one is 7 watts heat dissipation. This is a little more interesting. This is a 275 meg ohm wire wound resistor. You might wonder what, what on earth would you do with that, but um, these are commonly used for uh, probing high voltages. So for example, if you have a 20,000 volt power supply and you need to measure the voltage on it, you're going to use a probe that has one of these inside. Uh, this right here, these two, are uh, wire wound, ceramic, similar to the small one. This is flat. You can see there's a slot through the center. That slot is for a metal bracket, which also doubles as a heat sink. And uh, here you can see, same thing, but it's already got the metal bracket embedded in it. Again, same type of resistor, just much, much bigger. I believe this is 270 watts dissipation. It's 5 ohms. It's a cylinder instead of flat. And uh, that's uh, pretty much all the common types of fixed resistors that you're going to run across. All of these have a set value that can't be changed, at least not through normal means. There are many more types. This covers most of what you'll find for the past 
50 years, 1960s through current technology. Um, doesn't cover surface mount. You know, probably most of the circuitry people are doing now is surface mount. And really, a lot of the microcontroller stuff, you don't even need the uh, surface mount resistors because the chips haven't built in anymore. Over here, we've got variable resistors. These variable resistors uh, come in nearly an infinite variety. But these are some of the common ones. This right here is a dual pack. It's a kit for a ancient analog television, as it were, with a cathode ray tube. This has a thermistor and a varistor uh, that were used in the degaussing circuits for color televisions for a better part of the 20th century. Thermistors are also known as temperature dependent resistors, uh, TDR. They uh, vary their resistance based on the ambient temperature. So, you know, this metal plate here will track the uh, ambient temperature and uh, vary the resistance. This right here is a cadmium sulfide cell. I imagine a lot of people are familiar with these dust dawn sensors. Anything uh, where you need to not just detect that there's light or no light, but where you need to measure how much light is striking a surface. This functions by varying the resistance based on the number of photons that are striking the surface behind the lens there. This is a common potentiometer. This is a very poor quality one. I would call it junk. I have them. I wouldn't necessarily use them for anything. Uh, they have a tendency to fall apart after a few adjustments. Sometimes they don't work at all to begin with. I doubt they even make these anymore. But I have hundreds of them, so I try to put them to use when I can. This right here. Same thing, but this one's made of ceramic. It's a little bit higher quality. This one would be used for tweaking a circuit or, you know, any one of a number of adjustments. This here is a five turn potentiometer. Inside here is a wiper arm with worm gear and that screw is turning the worm gear and moving the wiper arm across the carbon film. This little guy right here, same thing. This has a little bit of advantage because it has a clear case on it. You can actually see the carbon film at the base, the worm gear, and the wiper arm assembly. So it gives you somewhat of an idea of what they look like on the inside. This right here is exactly the same component, it's just in a different case. This one also has a chassis mount. Stick a screwdriver down through that hole and inside it's the same set screw. This right here, this is a ganged potentiometer. You've got a center shaft, an outer shaft, and also you've got a push button contact. This is just stacked potentiometers. This is the outer ring, the inner ring, and the push button contacts. This would be found in a car stereo. Typically uh, car stereos have a control head right here so that's why this one's so deep. So this would be mounted on the main chassis board and then the control head would fill the space above it. This is a fairly typical Potentiometer, carbon film, probably three or five watts. Very typical design, chassis mount. It's bolted straight to a metal chassis or plastic or whatever. This is a slide pot. This is actually a fairly high quality slide pot. I don't know if you can see right there. You can see all the way through it. The bad part of slide plots is that they're almost always built 
with the carbon film laying flat and moving the wiper arm back and forth across it. You spill water in there or you get dust in there or crumbs or whatever. It will ruin the carbon. But this one's this one's a little bit more expensive. It has uh, the carbon film vertically along the side. Plus it's got these holes to uh, allow anything that does fall in there to be cleared out. This would have been used in a uh, mixer board, something like that. Audio mixer, studio mixer, maybe uh, tape decks, anything that would have a volume control. It gives you uh, just a lot more physical space. It lets you uh, have more fine control of the uh, resistance. This right here is something that you actually might use. The bad part of these is the only mechanical connection is the solder and your copper traces and those will break very easily. So if you can see there's a smooth spot there that can be used and really is meant to be used as a bearing. So you uh, put something, usually a plastic face plate or something like that, tight around that, just tight enough to where it'll turn. That gives you some mechanical support. But those are commonly used on Arduinos and things like that. Um, it's very good for microcontrollers, mainly because the pen spacing is the right, and they're very small, and they're, they're out of the way. They're cheap. Relatively well built, and they're cheap. Now that was, these are all carbon film. This is wire wound. This particular one is made by Beckman Instruments. The brand name is Helipot. This is, I think, a 25 turn wire wound helical potentiometer. This is very high accuracy. This is 0.25 percent. You'll see that it has a uh, registered dial. It has a break to lock the dial so it can't be moved. It counts from 0 to 99. This would have been used in uh, something like an oscilloscope. You know, something with uh, high precision, like a time delay oscilloscope, where you need to have very fine control of your uh, sweep rates and time delay. Fairly common on 1970s and 1980s vintage equipment. This here is a sort of a textbook wire wound potentiometer. It doesn't get any simpler than that. It's a coil of wire with a wiper arm. This is meant to be mounted directly to a circuit board. If you overload this, it's going to catch on fire. And uh, if it's open like this, you know, just open to the whole chassis, who knows, you know, an ember could fall out and catch a whole house on fire or something. So those are kind of dangerous, but um, so you want to you want to make sure that those are nice and uh, sealed up from the environment. This is exactly the same thing, it's just huge. This is, I think, 25 watts wire wound, but uh, this one actually has been blown. You can see the wire there, maybe. You know, what, what probably happened here is somebody ran too much current between these three, these two posts here, and had the wiper arm over here, and of course you get about here, and if you have enough current on this, it's just going to burn the coil up. But uh, makes it a good demo. Anyway, it's impressive looking. Now uh, this one right here, this is a totally different piece. This is a ladder network. This is very high precision. This has uh, 50 steps, 2 decibels per step. This is used as an attenuator for uh, audio circuits and uh, RF or whatever else. This particular one came out of a reel-to-reel -reel tape deck. Professional grade, probably made in the 1960s or 70s, I would guess. Maybe even earlier than that. This has a uh, service port on the bottom where you can clean the contacts. This one works by switching high precision resistors. 
You can see this one has a, a crack in the wiper arm, so it's no good. If it were working, you could get in here and adjust the tension and things like that, service it, clean it. That's kind of nice, especially if these are, you know, these, these can cost as much as $1,000 a piece new. So, you know, you're spending that much money, and you might have 10 of these in a single device. You really want to be able to make sure that you can clean it. This particular one here, if it was not broken, I've seen them for $400 on eBay, used, you know, 50 years old. Now you might wonder what this is. This has been sitting here kind of ominously. Well, let's see if you can read that. This claims to be a switch. That's, uh, that's really just a military lie or a simplification, I guess you'd call it. In the grand scheme of things, a switch is not worth anything, but uh, this, however, was probably thousands of dollars new. And it does include a switch, but it is not a switch itself. So, this one has never been opened. It's in a canvas bag lined with aluminum foil, hermetically sealed, using a uh, Method 1A8 packing, it says. They uh, evacuate all the air and seal it up, and I would imagine this would last for thousands of years like this. This one was made in 1957, and uh, looks like it was inventoried by the Department of Defense in 1959. This, I believe, came from the Naval Air Warfare Center before they closed and sold off to Raytheon. I have one open over here, which I will grab. So, here we go. Cut it open. There's a box inside. If you were anyone but the military, this is how you would get it. I don't know why it's pink, but for some reason military foil is pink. Um, box opens here. It's wrapped in paper. Down in here you've got a desiccant to absorb any moisture that was trapped in here when it was sealed. And here you go. There it is. Now this is useful to point out. These two are the same device. Almost exactly the same device, actually. They have a few different specifications. But you have a ladder network here. You can see this itself is a ladder network consisting of uh, three rotary switches. And, oh, look at that. You've got these high precision resistors right here, lots of them at different values. And depending on how the network is connected here, you'll have different sets of these configured. These are plus or minus 1% tolerance, which in 1957 was probably amazing. So there you go. That's what the inside of this looks like once you get through all the packing and cases. You can see here, maybe, these are even manufactured by the same company and have similar part numbers. It's just this one has a coarser uh, increments, and this is 2dB, this one's, it should say here, maybe. No, just a serial number. That, that's a thing to point out. This is so expensive. This is a resistor with a serial number. So it kind of gives you the an idea of the extremes on some of these devices. Connections, one, two, and three, you got your common. And the other ends as if this was just a regular potentiometer. And uh, there you go. That's a uh, look at a bunch of different uh, variable resistors. I hope you enjoyed.